All right. Hey. I'll let you know when we're on red. It says we're on red already. There we go. Top left. How good? <laughs> uh, all right. Let me get the. Uh... There we go. You have intro we, music? We are live. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. All right. If you let us know where you where you're joining us from. If you're from within the NSFA, let us know. If you're from a club, let us know. If you're outside the association, we'd, we'd love to hear where you're viewing us from. But we'll give it a few minutes, just let it fill up, get a bit of an audience, then we'll get cracking. All right. Looking good. We'll give it a few more, get some more people in. All right. All right, growing a bit of an audience. I guess while we wait for a few people, Ben, Kai, how's your week been? What have you guys been up to? Well, good, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, still developing online training programs all week, so uh, yeah, it's good to be good to be back or coming back soon, I guess. Oh, that's good to hear, mate. Um, ben, how have you been? What you uh, been very, to? very good. I've uh, set myself the the silly challenge of trying to run two hundred kilometers in a month because obviously with no football, you you go stir crazy. So. I realized two days in that that was a mistake, but being the kind of person I am, I can't sort of stop something a few days in. So I'm now five days away from the end of the challenge and it's probably the worst thing I've ever done with my life, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's, that's been my, my week so far. All right. Fair enough. And I guess has, uh, from a, from a football point of view, have you been, been trying to, trying to keep active with your, with your teammates as well? Um, have you guys been staying connected? Is there anything in particular as a team you've been doing? Yeah, so actually, funnily enough, we last night we had a, a Zoom catch up with the with the team and we had a bit of a, a trivia game. So because I think it would have been this weekend, Kai, that we were meant to have the camp. Uh, yes, pretty much uh, yeah. this 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 weekend. Yes, you're right. So yeah, we're meant to have a selection camp this weekend. So it was good to to see everybody's faces. It's been weeks if not months since we've um since we've seen each other face to face so it's always good to catch up digitally and over zoom and do a bit of fun and get a bit of banter going with the guys all right that's all good um all right that's good to hear well i guess um first of all thanks for thanks for joining us um i think again this is a very very interesting time and i guess we're trying to to keep active and, and connected as a as a football community um, so for you guys to take a bit of time out and join us um, is awesome. And I guess from, from our point of view, and just to kind of start off with, um, do you guys just want to give us a little bit of an intro in regards to, to yourself, maybe starting with you, Kai, just a bit of a, a quick little brief of, of yourself and, and where you're at? Yeah, sure, sure. So I'm fortunate uh, enough to work in football. So I'm head coach of uh, Obviously, the Paris, but also the head coach at Knox Grammar School. Um, so I played um, professional football in Germany before I came out 2000. It's a long time ago. Um, worked then where, with, with some, some clubs, uh, with, with Linfield. Uh, um, had, a, had a great time at Linfield um, with the Northern Tigers, um, also with um, the state teams. And um, yeah, so as I said, I'm, I'm very fortunate. To, to be working in, in football now for over what, 20 years as a, as a full-time coach. Um, so still, as I said, busy, uh, like, like everyone else out there, seven days a week, but um, loving every minute of it. 
All right. Um, no, that's that's really good to hear, mate. And I guess how about how about you, Ben? Do you want to give us a little bit of a brief of uh, where you're currently at? Yep. So current currently playing for the Paroos have been since 2008 now. So almost or almost half my life. Um, started with the started with CP football when I was about nine years old, and haven't really looked back since. Um, Kai's been my head coach now for going on. I want to say nine, nine, ten years, and we've, he's been he's been a mainstay in my life since I would have been about thirteen or fourteen. Um, so yeah, very fortunate. All right, no, that's that's great to hear. So um, I guess I want to get straight into it and just just to get to to know you both a little bit better. I've got some questions up front to to go through. So we'll go through a, a few little quick ones for you. But I guess to start off with um. Kai, what's been, uh, I guess, your favourite activity so far in isolation? Uh, just teaching my one and a half year old to play football. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> so, no, she's quick. She's already quicker than me, which is not that difficult. But uh, no, enjoying time with my my little daughter, with um, my son, with my my uh, my wife. So that's been my my favourite time because, as I said, we're still busy. But I think if our yeah, if we wouldn't have had COVID at the moment, we yeah, it'll be like 60, 70 hour a week sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I said, enjoy, enjoying the time with the family is my, my main, main, main pastime at the moment. All right. And I think, yeah, full time football usually mm-hmm. does uh, lead to, yeah, long hours, long days. But I think uh, the passion usually uh, gets us through. So good to hear you got some, some time with your family there. And how about you, Benny? What's been uh, some things you've been doing in, in isolation that you're enjoying? The um the weird one uh, is t- I've been getting into table tennis a lot. A couple of things. Table tennis. Uh-huh. I've been working on table tennis skills because I, at some stage in my life, I want to beat Kai in a game. Still, <laughs> I don't think I've beaten him yet. <laughs> All right. So, what, Kai, you're a bit of a table tennis pro over here. He's a machine. Well, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, said, I think my, my fitness at the moment is letting me down as well. I think okay, you had a, you'd have a good chance right now, I reckon. <laughs> all right fair enough um all right and then i guess from from both of you just a bit of a, a football question here so favorite player of all time ben do you want to tell us who stands out for you i'm gonna i'll go cliche and say ronaldo just because purely because of the work ethic he shows he, he's relentless in in the way he approaches his his craft um and it's very inspiring and motivating to see somebody who's at the top of their game and continues to push further and further to see where the limits are in, in his game and in, in football in general. All right. And I think um, from, from knowing you as a player, I think your work, work ethic is something that definitely stands out. So good to see uh, yeah, following, following in the steps of, of a great one. Uh, Kai, favourite player for you yeah, all time? Yeah, it's more a blast from the past. It's uh, it's a guy called Rudy Vela, uh, which yeah, I don't expect okay. any of you guys to know. Him, uh, best haircut as well. Um, but no, he was um, he was my idol growing up, and I was actually I never really get starstruck in my life. I met some nice, interesting people, but he was the only person who actually, when I met him, I had no idea what to say to him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, he's he's certainly um, yeah. As I grow grew up watching him. Uh, a striker from Werder Bremen back in the days, back in the back from the good days. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, Rudy Vola. I think I've seen him on FIFA when I when I used to play. <laughs> Nineteen ninety five. <laughs> yeah, in some of the in some of the classic teams or something like yeah. that. Um, well, guys, again, thank thanks for joining us. Good to good to catch up. I think Ben, the last time I saw you, um, we were at the Paris Development Centre up yes. in LA on a, on a Sunday <laughs> morning, um, and I think Kai, the last time I saw you um, was at the Paris documentary um, launch. Mm. And then I think before that, I was um, scoring some goals against you and I was giving you a bit of a headache. On the <laughs> um, but we don't need to talk about that. That's all right. Um, so I guess, guys, the, the theme for tonight really is around, I guess, leading, inspiring and creating a positive team culture. And I think um, the reason why I reached out to, to both of you, um, because I think the Paru story is, is really quite, quite incredible um, in regards to the journey that... Um, you guys have gone on over the past kind of really decade. Um, so I really want to guess dive into to that area. Um, so I guess before we, we kind of 
move into that? I would just like to get a bit of an understanding more, more around, I guess, you as individuals and what, what got you to kind of where you are. So I guess starting off with, with you, Kai, and I guess your journey as a, as a coach um, to, the, to the top end at the Pararoos, do you want to give us some, some insight around your journey and I guess why you moved into coaching? Um, yes, I mean, why I moved into coaching was um, applied I played, um, as I mentioned earlier, I played professional football in Germany and uh, I grew up um, in a little village called Voxtrup. Uh, and my club was Viva Voxtrup, like so many other kids, I guess, uh, in, in Europe and around the world. And uh, my coach back in the days was a guy called uh, Fidzi, uh, Jörg Licher. And he was the most inspiring person I've, uh, I've ever met. And he was my coach. Um, so obviously I loved every minute going to the game, loved every uh, second. And it was, it was because of him. And obviously we had a great team culture back then uh, when I was 12, 13, 14 and everything. But when I signed my first professional contract, I thought I want to give something back, not knowing at the time that actually coaching would be my thing or that I really make it profession a hundred years later. But I think it was more, um, um, I wanted to give something back. So I, I coached an under six team at my home club and only then realized how actually hard the whole thing is. And I was six, uh, was 17 years old at the time, I believe, and did it with my best mate. Shortly after I done my UEFA B because I really, I just love coaching and uh, um, took an under 15 team then from Germany, from the same, my home club, really good team. And yeah, sort of things sort of moved on from there and, and I think um, we had numerous conversations about that, always trying to improve and trying to get better. And I always feel that's the one of the coach's traits, right? You, you, you never stop learning. And through that, as I said, my journey took me then to, to Australia and uh, yeah, the other bits I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So um, that's what made me start coaching. I like, I love the bit where we, you know, you, you, um, um, yeah, you just, you can, you can, you can enjoy this the game as much, or you can give something to someone who's enjoy the game as much as yeah, the coach did when I was a young boy. Yeah, and I think um, that's a great great point. And I think I definitely want to touch on it a little bit later around the coach being that 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 inspiration to to young players and really I guess driving um, I guess their their want to to re- and their love for football really. Um, and I think yeah. yeah. Definitely, if you get that that coach that can do that at a young age, you can really, I guess, continue or keep you within the game. So I think that's really, really nice. Um, I guess moving on to, to Ben, just in regards to, to your journey as a player, um, and I guess coming through through Australia um, with, I guess, um, yeah, I guess a different journey than, than others. Do you want to kind of touch on, on, I guess, a bit of your story? Yeah, for sure. So I started playing football when I was about four. Uh, played a uh, mainstream or able-bodied football up until about the age of nine, eight, nine, and that was when I was introduced to CB football. It's actually because my dad was playing um, a match against a team, and he noticed one of the opposition had CP. And after the game, he he went up to the guy and said, "Look, weird question, maybe, but you don't have cerebral palsy, do you?" I said, "Actually, actually, I do." And he's quite a handy player too. Um, Anyway, they sort of, mum and dad asked him if there were any avenues for, for kids with CP. And he said, well, there's the Australian CP football team. Um, and that was my introduction to it. And I kind of haven't really looked back since. I sort of found, I, I still remember the first time I bought, walked into the, the, the basketball stadium. It was, we would, it was a Friday night and we were doing, playing a game and just seeing all these guys, adults with CP who didn't didn't seem to phase them at all um they weren't really letting their disability get in the way of them and as a nine-year-old you're sort of looking up at these guys idolizing them that they're running around they're scoring goals hitting them top corner like it was just it was a whole new world that had opened up to me and um yeah i've uh, it's it's been a it's been a good journey since and i'm glad that i'm now in a position where i can sort of give those those gifts back to that, that younger generation. All right. And that's really, really interesting, I guess. So for, for you um, coming up, I guess, first starting playing with, with able bodies, how did mm. you, how did you find that? And I guess, was there, um, yeah, any, any hesitation from your parents or even you? 
Yeah, there was slight, I suppose there was slight hesitation from my parents. I can't really remember back that far. It's quite a few years ago now. But um, I, I do remember I didn't really get much game time in the able body setup, and it wasn't until I got into the C, the the CP side that I actually I had this belief that because I had CP. I had a bit of a cap on on how good I could get in the in the able body body setup, and um, it was it wasn't until I saw those guys, the the Chris Pines, the Barbers, the Roaches, and some of the older players that sort of I looked up to, see them even though they had CP, their cap or the 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 skill level that they could get to was so much higher than I'd ever thought I'd be able to set for myself, and so up until about 14, 15, like I sort of was hovering around an average player. And then I sort of understood that it was the work ethic, regardless of if you have CP or whatever your circumstances are, it was the work ethic that got you to those next levels. Yeah. And I think um, that's a, that's a great message in saying that in anything that you really do, um, if you can mm. apply yourself and you can work hard um, and also, you know, have belief in yourself, I think you can, you can get quite far. So um, that's awesome to hear that, I guess, yeah, seeing some role models um, mm. and some people that you inspire to from a young age, um, you know, really drive forward or drive you forward in the game. That's, that's awesome to hear. Um, so I guess um, along, along maybe your, your coaching journey, Kai, um, and I guess you've said, you know, there's, there's inspiration from, um, you know, some of the, the coaches that coached you, were there any things that, that I guess stood out? And I guess when you, when you got into coaching that you were going to say, okay, well, this is how I'm going to coach because X, Y, and Z, was there anything that from you and a value point of view that you definitely knew you were going to impart to other people when you started coaching? Yeah, it's a great question, actually, because I took everything from every coach I had. And I was fortunate enough to have a, had a whole array of different personalities as coaches. I had a Dutch one, a Russian one, a German one, um, you know. So I, I think you, you take a lot of good things out of it, but I think you can also take a lot of bad things out of it, how you don't want to do it and yeah. how they make you feel is probably more, more than anything as well. Like a, under what coach did I actually play at my absolute best was when the and for me, it was when the coach really, really cared, you know, and, and the coach was really give you this confidence of, you know, that you're allowed to do mistakes, that you can try things. So that was really what I, I took, took a lot, you know, sort of from, from the coaches I had in the past. But also then, obviously, some who weren't that great and who, you know, were a bit, maybe a bit too distant or, you know, um, just would yell at you if you miss, miss, miss a goal or something, you know, which doesn't make sense, right? Like, it's, it's not that we're trying to miss miss a shot and you know we miss we miss plenty right so that's that's sort of um the, you know, the, the key thing is like you know as coaches like our communication is so important like so what you say when you say it but the main thing is really that you, you need to care you need to care for the person you're coaching as the number one thing and then you need to you know inspire the player as, as, as Eka just said inspire the player to have a good work ethic but then also have the belief that they are allowed to do mistakes, that they can do these things, you know, because all the other pressures are already there. You know, you don't, you don't need to uh, reiterate any of that. It's just really about, uh, you're allowed to do mistakes. You know, you can, I, I get upset if people don't try. Yeah. That's sort of, or if you get lazy or things, but with the Parus, I haven't, haven't experienced that. So um, that's, that's obviously all credit to the team, I guess. Uh, can yeah. I just can I just quickly add on to that? It's one of Kai, one of Kai's biggest strengths, and he talks about it, but he definitely backs it up. Is the fact that he cares about the human before the player. And there's times where overseas where you you probably some of the games aren't going as well as you'd hoped, or your performances haven't gone as well as you hoped, and he's there straight away to see how you're going as a person, and having that belief in you that you can make mistakes, you can be safe to to express yourself in, in a game or around around the guys. It, it creates this culture where you can be yourself and it seems to bring out the best in the players because it starts with that care about the person before the player. Yeah, and um, I think that that's totally true and I think that that's consistent across, um, yeah, any sort of teacher or coach in saying that, yeah, there's like no one, um, 
yeah, no one, I guess, cares um, how much you know until you know they know that you care yeah. um, and around mm-hmm. that connection before content. And I think um, as soon as you can uh, build that trust with a player or a team um, and they, they can really feel um, that sense of connection and care with you as a coach or a leader, um, you know, they can really buy into to what you're what, what you want them to do. And I think, um, you know, truly remarkable things can happen off that. So that's, that's really, really cool, Ben, to hear that you feel that from Kai. Um, but there's, think- um, yeah. there's no difference, by the way, with whatever level you're coaching. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter if you coach a power or on under 16. You still need to care, you know, a player who's five or six years old, you know, and as a coach, if you're standing there with a mobile phone or you, you know, you don't say anything the whole session, then you don't care. You know, and then you'll get that back from the players. But if you do care and you're six years old and for that moment you want to be, yeah, you want to talk about dinosaurs and if you coach the five or six years old, yeah, yeah. then you, you want to be part of it and you need to, you know, get yourself back into that sort of age group. You know, and yeah. I think um, uh, that's that's important on every every level, not just the Paru's level or, you know, any sort of elite level. It, that's all across. Yeah. You, you actually, you also see that like when we're overseas and it does, I suppose, like I said, it doesn't matter what level, like as players, we're looking to the coach to see what his emotional state is, what, how he's sort of acting around the team. You, you're not just listening to what he's saying, but you're also looking at what he, how he's, how he's acting. And if he seems to have everything under control, then that allows you to relax as a player and okay, well, he's got the game plan. He, he knows what, he knows how we need to perform. We can just trust in the process and trust in, in the plan and we can go, go from there. Mm. And I think that's huge that I guess a large majority of what we take in is body language, um, mm. not always what we say. And I think, yeah, if, if a, a coach or a leader is kind of exuding that confidence and belief within themselves, but also the, the wider team, um, it can really, really rub off on everyone and start building a, a nice, positive um, and safe environment for, for players and the team to flourish. Um, so I guess for, for those that are, that are viewing, if you have any questions for, for Ben um, or Kai, chuck it in the, the comment section and we'll definitely um, jump through it throughout. Um, but I think for, for you guys, I just wanted to, to spend a bit of time for you both just giving us, a, I guess, a bit of a, a brief around the power route. Um, and I guess your kind of story and your kind of journey with them. So I'll chuck over to you, Kai, and I guess you've been with them, you were saying, since about 2006, um, which is, uh, I guess, a, a very, very long time. But uh, can you give us a bit of a, a, an idea around, I guess, your kind of journey with, with the Power Roos and, I guess, why you got involved with them in the first place? Yeah, why I got involved in them was an, is an interesting one. But um, I, got, I, was, um, I was a state coach at the time, uh, Metro side with Football News as well, and so was Paul Brown, the, the former head coach. And um, we were both scouting at, uh, in Central Coast. So um, we got on really well and uh you know um he just basically asked me if i'll I'll be interested to get involved i obviously had a million questions um because as you do you want to plan you want to prepare but all he said just you know just just come in you'll you know you'll you'll be fine and uh basically coming in the first camp i absolutely loved every minute of it you know um not just like just sort of the eagerness of everyone wanting to learn um obviously being in a national team setup um, but just the atmosphere was was something very very unique. And over the years, um, as I said, I, I tremendously enjoyed working with Paul. And um, you know, then I think 2015, just after we lost our funding, 2014, 2015 um, or 2014, Paul resigned. 2015, um, I got asked to be the the, um, the head coach. So my first tournament was the World Cup in England. Um, that was great, but that was also a start of a, of a journey, you know? Um, and um, yeah, I, I enjoy being assistant coach, enjoy being a head coach. I've got some wonderful staff I'm working with. And when we're talking about building the trust or what Eka earlier said on about the confidence, um, you know, you have like, it's the team that gives you the belief, but it also gives the staff you have around you who will give you that, that, that calmness, a sense of, Hey, we've been here, we've done that. We worked very hard, so now let's just go out and enjoy ourselves and let's do do what we came came out here for. So I'm very lucky that I have amazing staff um, as well with me. And um, from England, went to Denmark, needed to qualify for the World Championship 2017. That was the part where they uh, where uh, Tom Ferguson did the documentary. 
Um, massive game. One of my favorite, favorite one, it's hard to say because I enjoy every game, but game against Spain in Denmark was so important for our whole program. Uh, and it was basic. We knew it was difficult against Scotland, so we had to win our very first game. We had to win to qualify for Argentina. If we wouldn't have won that game, it would have been a whole different story. And who knows where our program would have been now um, without sounding too negative. But we needed to qualify. And that game was, um, yeah, still talking about it right now. I get goosebumps about it because it was really, yeah, it was very, very special. And I might have looked from the outside that I had everything under control. But trust me on the inside, I think... Uh, and normally I don't get that nervous before games or in games. I actually love that. I love only football gives you that sort of that bit of sense of, yeah, something really exciting coming up. Mm. I don't know if it's really nervous or anything, but it's more like the adrenaline kicks in. I, that's how I, I, I say it. And that game, I was certainly, <laughs> that was nervous. <laughs> and uh, uh, we won that one. So that was special. Got to the world championships. Again, second favorite game there was against Argentina, the 1-1. One, one. I said, anyone wants to watch the documentary or did watch it, it was 1-1 one, one over 60 minutes. So it was a draw against the top four side at the time, which we haven't had um, for a long time, a very long time. And um, so that was very special, even though we ended up losing it an extra time. But it was still that we were able to compete against them was, was sort of um, the result of the hard work we all did. And then the home game um, against Canada was very special because there's so many people, there are so many people watching live, thousands of people. And it really showed that Australia does care about the Parus and that, that we've sort of arrived. And uh, um, that was nice. But that was just pure joy from the very first moment to the last. So that was not a single bit of nervousness or adrenaline, not even. It was really just joy. I really enjoyed the moment and I was happy for the players that they can actually experience that so it was an amazing event so that was a journey for, so far so hopefully um you know we've got a few more from a, a great moments coming up but that was sort of uh my side of the paru so far i guess yeah and i guess um on that i think yeah we'll, we'll touch on the the documentary as we go forth but i think um yeah it's interesting that you say you know those games those moments that you know you get that that feeling or that that excitement towards going out and it's awesome and I think um from the support that the Paroos have got um over the past few kind of years to have that that game in Canada um at, oh sorry at Cromer Park against Canada um was I guess a really really special moment for for you all um then I guess from from your your side of things um when did you you first get involved in the Paroos setup and I guess how's your journey journey been throughout um yeah up until today do i have you there ben benny you just need to uh, un unmute yourself i probably need to unmute myself i think unless you can do sign language <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um i start so i started in the parus when i was 13 uh, and a couple of key moments stand out for me. I think in 2007, I was eligible to go to my first tour in Brazil. And I'd sort of made the assessment that I thought I had it over a couple of the players that um, were vying for the that 14th spot. We play in seven aside, so we generally take 14 players. Um, and I got the phone call that I didn't make the team. And... I still have the feeling today of the heartbreak and the, the, it was, it was just pure heartbreak that I didn't make it. I thought I'd done everything that I could do to, to put myself in the best possible position, not knowing at the time that I'm 15, like any 15 year old think it just, I couldn't comprehend it. And that moment, I sort of, I could have gone down one of two paths. I could have given up quite easily and said, well, this isn't for me. Or I sort of took the other path of, okay, I'm going to work twice as hard, get up in the morning, do my training and put myself in a position where it's a non, like it's, it's a non, uh, I, t I wanted to take the control back for me. I didn't want to leave it in somebody else's hands. And ever since then, I've sort of taken the same attitude and I don't sort of see myself as a good player. I still see myself as, 
a hard working player in a weird way. I still don't think that I've my spots guaranteed even after quite a few years. So something that's, that's helped me get to the position I'm in now, but it's given me so many great opportunities to, to play under a coach like Kai for the past, well, for my whole career. It's, it's been incredible and I feel so fortunate and grateful. And it's just from a, I suppose, from a position where Kai is the kind of bloke that would call me out of the blue on a Monday just to see how I'm doing. Like it, he, he just cares about us as people before players. And for the, the Paroos has given me life. Like I, I don't, I, I've, I've said it before, but I don't think I would be here without the Paroos. Um, and it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing that a group of people can have that effect on, on you, like that, that sense of belonging and safety. Um, it's, it's been incredible. Um, and so many tours, the Canada game stands out. The Argentina game won all against Argentina in Argentina, ranked fourth in the world. The last time we played them two or three years before we lost 13 nil, Like not much changes physically in three or four year period, but it's just the belief that the Kyle was able to instill in us as a team to, to get a result like that. That was, it still gives me goosebumps. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had an incredible journey. I've been very fortunate. Um, yeah, it's been pretty cool. Yeah, and I think that's um, wonderful to hear you kind of speak about a team um, with, I guess, that much that much passion, but also, I guess, that much emotion mm -hmm. to say that, yeah, a team, a group of people, a group of strangers that have been able to come together and form something so special, um, that being around around football is, is amazing. I think there's, there's a few things to unpack um, in it. I think it's fascinating that, you know, you're one of the – the top players um being in, in the in the power route setup um yet you're still on the mindset that i've still got to work for my position i've still got to work hard um it's not over i haven't made it yet and i think sometimes yeah you get some people with a mindset definitely within football you know okay i make the team and the work's done it's like no you make the team and the work has just begun um and i guess that mindset is is definitely the reason why that you're still i guess at the top and still competing um and i think that, that's a fantastic mindset to to adopt and definitely one that um i'm sure for, for all those young players out there is something that you need to have that that deep worth ethic um so i think you guys have you guys have touched um on it around the culture and i, I guess i want to talk um a little bit about some of the, the setbacks that the team has had and then i guess how this this sense of belonging and culture has really kind of taken you guys forward so um i guess kai do you want to kind of talk to us a little bit around um some of the the i guess setbacks the team has had over the, the past few years in particular around um the funding for for the national program yes of course so um, we lost our funding once, um, and um, that was obviously heartbreaking. And I think I think um, it was almost like uh, we're talking with in our core values about family, but it was always it, it, it cuts so deep. Um, but as Eka said a bit earlier, I'm a strong believer in if if bad things happen to you, you know they they happen for a reason, and something is going to come out of the end of it. I mean, we had that conversation with COVID earlier before we went online um and always see the goods and the good thing in it and if if you think about the funding we lost the funding that was that was horrible but what it did it made everyone realize how special it is to represent australia to represent the parus um and that helped in a way as well to 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 shape who we are um and um again there's so many people who worked incredibly hard if it's there format coach if we've got some some within the ffa we've got it's such a massive team and obviously the team itself to get us back on the pitch um and yeah then to sort of again struggle again before the denmark uh game yeah but i think that certainly helped shape a culture for sure you know if you have sort of experience like that together um on top of that um, our goalkeeper coach had, a, had an idea just before Denmark to install core values because he just sort of went through with that with his, his workplace. And uh, he, he thought of sort of asking if we were interested in that. And I thought straight away, I said, yeah, no, that's great. Let's put it on paper. I mean, we all can talk about a great team culture. We can talk about 
how wonderful everything is, but let's put it onto paper and actually, um, you know, see how we can actually manifest that, not just for us, but for, for years to come. Um, and again, that's not something only the Parus can do. You can do it obviously in every business. You can even do it to a degree with your under six team or over 35 team or any team really, just really sort of deep values of what you want to represent, where you want to go. And that's obviously your philosophy, your vision bit. But the values are really important that you you actually talk about how you want to uh, how you want to act around each other and and we're, again we're not perfect at it I'm not saying that we are um, but I think what we are becoming now is really uh, honest about it and talk about it and I think that's really really important um, we have got um, in every team meeting we players talking about where we seen the core values uh, where we seen positive sides of the core values but also where we've seen the core values maybe not honored in a way we should. Um, and again, that sort of honesty draws around the whole, whole, um, whole team now. Like we, we can talk to each other and, you know, it's not everything is perfect and not everything is great. And, and we still have, you know, players wanting to, to leave the Parus because it's not professional. They're not getting paid. So it's, it is a massive commitment. And I understand that. Um, but the ones who are there and, and everyone who represented the, the Parus on what level um, got the core values on their way and to, to, to have them not only in their footballing life, but you know, some of the players are now drawing from that in their professional life as well. So I can probably kick the ball over to Aka there to, to you know, uh, I to think see what it means to the players rather than me continuously talking about the core values. I think that the, the, amazing thing that Kai did as a coach was to facilitate and, and the goalkeeping coach, uh, Haki the, and the whole staff, really, they created this, they facilitated or created this framework for the players to come up with the core values. So we actually had a meeting as a playing group to decide, okay, what is, as a power group, what is important to us? And we decided on uh, five core values of family, legacy, professionalism, respect and commitment and legacy came out quite quite clearly last year in the Canada game like we we came up with these core values five years ago and then for us to see the Canada Canada game come to life see all these young kids with CP from the Paris Development Centre as well to see them see us on the pitch in front of one and a half thousand people and thousands of people on TV like it it goes to how important core values can be we we like Kai said every team meeting, every tour we we continually come back to these five core tenants or five core pillars that we try and focus the team around. And it, and the beauty of it is we we have higher retention of players, which allows us to develop better as a team because we're not turning over players as much and people buy in more. It, it's 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 such an intangible thing, but the results are so tangible if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. And I think, um, as I guess, yeah, Kai, you, you alluded to, I think um, with any team, whether that be a, a football team or an organisation, um, having a, 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 a clear sense of um, who we are, what we stand for and why um, is really, really important to, to the success and to really, really tie people together um, to something kind of outside them and have that shared kind of purpose um, mm. and alignment. And I think, Ben, again, to hear you actually you know, speak about it and how it makes you feel. Um, it's just credit to, to how strong that culture is. Um, and I think as well, I guess, something about culture and building it is, is the buy-in and, and having everyone involved in, 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 in I guess, creating that, those values and, and culture is really, really important. Because again, you know, Kai could stand up there and, and say, well, these are the five values because I said so. Um, but without that kind of, I guess, collaboration, from, from a team point of view, um, sometimes it doesn't flourish. So it's really, really positive to hear. And again, I think the fact that you said family um, being number one and then you saying, you know, you really, really do feel part of the family, again, is a credit to, to the culture that you guys have created. Um, so I guess around, around your, your culture, I guess, and maybe from a, from a broad point of view, um, what would you guys say then? So what, what are those kind of key elements that make a great culture? What are some things that, um, whether it's coaches out there, even people who are, you know, have their own business or leading people, what are some, some elements that, that you think really make a great culture? 
So I'll, I can start with that if you want. I mean, first of all, it needs to come, as Eka just said, it needs to come out of the team. Um, I mean, obviously, you need to have your your ideas on how you want to you want to you want to set things or your philosophy, your vision, all of these bits. And, but really, it needs to come from within the team um, or the workforce, however you want to. You know, it needs to uh, there needs to be an ownership of of all of it. Um, as coaches, we, we yes, we're coaches, and yes, we want to try to inspire in some sort of shape and form. To be honest, we, we're facilitators. You know, we have the, the you can have the, as as a as a coach or boss or staff or whatever you can have the best ideas in the world, um, but if the if the team is not not connected, or if the team is not um, part of the decision making process, then you know it's it's never going to work. And we're not 40, 50 years ago where you know the coach is just going to say yeah do this do that do that and you just do it. I remember some of the training sessions I did. If I look at the back of them now, I said. I'm not sure why I should do 50 jumps in the air. I don't know that makes sense to do 60, 50 meter sprints in a row, you know, but I just did it mm. and you just yeah. do it, right? These days, if you do it, you have half the players going, well, why are we doing that? You know, and um, I, I think it's important. Like as I said, the, um, every, I believe this, again, every coach is different, right? But I believe it, it's, it's a player-led environment where you got to have to have a massive impact um, from the from the players and when it comes to culture uh, then have good leaders very good leaders and i'm not only talking about age with leaders i'm not talking about okay if you're a captain you're a leader yeah of course we have wonderful captains and, and we have wonderful leaders but i think it's important as well for a 15 or 16 year old to be a good leader and we've we're blessed that we have some very young young players who are already showing extremely good leadership qualities you know, for some of them yesterday, for example, um, for Jeremy to, 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 to speak up and openly talk about his feelings in, um, in a Zoom meeting with 30 guys plus staff, that's leadership qualities. Mm. Yeah, that is someone who steps up and has got, no, listen, I've got this, I've done that, I've done that. Yeah, so that's very impressive, I think. But it also feels that he's safe to, to speak up in an environment like, like, like the players have created. Yeah. Yeah. We, we reward good behavior in, in those instances. Like we, we, we reinforce those positive, we give, use positive reinforcement. You read all these things in these books, but we apply them in the team environment. And we have a, I wouldn't say we, we, we don't have, e we have egos. Every team has egos, but we, we keep those egos in check. And regardless, like I said, regardless of the player's age, if they're showing leadership qualities, like one of our sayings is, there's 14 players in the team. There's 14 leaders. Everyone is a leader on and off the pitch, regardless of your experience, your age, skill level. It's it's a it's a family, and we keep coming back to this this family idea. A, a young player comes in. Once somebody's in the Paru squad, that they're, they're a family member. We we treat them like we you would a, a sibling or a parent. That's it. It's that's culture in its simplest form. Yeah, I think you're right in regards to the, the, the sense of belonging, um, the connection. And then as you guys were talking about that, that kind of shared vision that goes forward. And I think, Kai, in that, um, I guess, seeing your role as the facilitator um, is really, really interesting and something that I also resonate with in regards to, you know, okay, yes, you help build build the culture. Maybe as a coach, you help lead the direction, but it is that player-centred approach um, whereby the players are taking ownership and, and guiding um, their own own journey. And I guess on that, Ben, so how does that look like from, from day to day and within training? Um, do you want to speak about maybe some of the experience that, that I guess, speaks to the fact that you as players really kind of yeah, took control and, and really, really drove forward within the leadership group that I'm sure you're a part of? Well, uh, we're in a unique position where we're only getting together sometimes four times a year for, for a camp and then one tour a year. So I suppose it's, it's different to a, a, a regular local club team, but it's just, it's more, I suppose it's, it's important in both scenarios. But for us, it's, it's critically important because we don't see each other very often. Yet we, we're saying that we're a family. How, how does that work? You don't see somebody for three months yet, your family. We, we, have, we have our Facebook chats we we do we had trivia night last night with the team we, we have all these smaller things to keep the the rapport levels high and to make sure we all stay connected um 
it's it's just it's it's not something that's happened overnight either like this has been years in the making and it, and it continues to build momentum um and and the results are starting to show they've, they've shown since since we've started to implement the this core value since 2015 our performances continue to get better and better and we're, we're currently ranked 10th in the world when really based on our maybe ability or uh, we we probably should be maybe 15th or 16th but we we seem to always outperform our rank at every tournament we go to and that just it just comes back it comes down to work ethic and we we don't drive i suppose we don't we reward skill but we reward work ethic and if somebody hasn't done the training or done their home program when they come into camp and i'm sure kai can talk to this as well the, these players don't get rewarded with game time kai rewards hard hard work and ethic mm. And I think just on that, Kai, so um, speaking to what Ben said there around the team not coming together that often, so that I guess as a leader, as a coach, I guess, how do you approach that? How do you stay connected? How do you try to continue to inspire and empower your players when you're not seeing them day to day or even, you know, two, three times a week? Well, I don't see my brother that often either. (laughs) (laughs) He lives lives in Germany and I, I love him to bits. So when I do actually talk to him and I get to see him, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, and there's no difference with our team. Um, I still speak to my brother. I still speak to you know, um, my team um, and you know, individual players and, and the ones who, you know, um, yeah, like I know, for example, now with, with, with all the COVID and, and everything, I, I had to make sure that everyone's all right. And I, I want to make sure that everyone, well, you know, it's, it'll be the same again, the same thing, something would be wrong with my brother. Like I call him up to make sure he's okay. So um, I think that's no, no difference, you know. Um, and only because you don't see each other for a month or two months or three months, um, I think it's more exciting than to get together. Like I'm, we're Friday into camp on Monday, I'm buzzing. So, and mm-hmm. I guess, you know, a lot of the players are very similar there. But as Eka mentioned it, we do stay connected, you know. Um, of course, you know, you speak on the phone, um, if it's an email, if it's just a little comment, if it is, um, you know, some of the things we, we see on Huddle, if it is some of the chat about the training program, you know, or the smarter base, you know, if I get an, uh, get an alert on there. So all, all these things, we are we are staying connected. Uh, and as like I mentioned, it's, it's just these little things, you know, as I said, I don't speak to my brother all the time, but I'm still, you know, love him to bits. <laughs> <laughs> um and I think, yeah, the, the small gestures and the small gestures then along the way, um, just continually creating that, that environment and for people to know that you care. And I think as well, underneath that, trust and everyone feeling like they trust each other. And I think, again, yeah, those little small gestures along the way um, really do help build that. Um, and again, I think it speaks to, to you, Kai, in regards to, you know, taking that individual approach and really, really touching on um, each individual and seeing how they're going. Um, just on that, I think that we got a question from uh, Jake Cohen. Um, and he was asking, so how do you bring out the best in each individual um, and their needs within the team context? So maybe within, within a training session, um, how do you bring the best out of that individual whilst also ensuring that the team um, is, I guess, moving forward? It's a longer process. I don't think there's like a, a magic word um, that you say, but I think, as Aka mentioned, positive reinforcement is important. I mean, you can't just go through a training session and constantly praise everything someone is doing because then obviously it has no impact, right? But there are key moments as well when you, you, you've, you've seen something that is very good. Um, praise really is important. And again, I'm only drawing from the way I wanted to feel. It's the same thing if I design a training session. That is very rigorous how I go through to design a training session until actually delivering it. I'm going to go with two things. I'm going to go one, actually, uh, would I enjoy it as a player, that training session? And two, what would I learn? If, if both of this is ticked, okay, I'll design the training session. Yeah, And I think within that session, then, if you see something very good, you have to say it, you know, and you have to get excited about it as well. Um, if, I mean, sometimes it's, you don't need to say a lot. And it's, 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 it's more a bit of a feeling how the session goes. You know, I'm, I'm now going a bit, if you see your players twice a week, yeah, then you have your ups and downs, right? I can, I can safely say I haven't had a down session with the Parus. 
Um, yes, we might have from the quality point of view where it was at the start, maybe not as great. And that's okay, you know, but not, never really down session. Well, I think if you're coaching a uh, club team, whichever club, NPL, anyone, you, you have your ups and downs. You've got a little bit, some players who need a bit of extra. And that's knowing your player. I think it's important here because some players really need a kick in the backside to get that little bit extra out. Some players need that bit of price. Some players need to just be left alone. Um, it, it, every player is different. And as I said, I'm not saying, and I'm not claiming that I'll get everything right there. But I think knowing your player is very, very important. Knowing how you can get the best, best out of them, of course. Again, some, some are really good with price and some are really good just with negative sort of, not, not necessarily a lot with negative, but more like, a, you know, a just pretty cool. Get geared up, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's 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 knowing your player. I think it's is probably the 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 most important thing, and that's you can only know your player by talking to your players, yeah, and understanding and see how they feel, and that comes back to family, honest as well. Like hmm. you know, if you speak to your players, you you want to find out what's going on, yeah, or what what how do they tick, and that sort of when I had a coach, um, um, it was under eighteen. And who was an amazing communicator. Yeah. So he he knew exactly how to deal with me. And I wasn't easy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I wasn't, I was certainly wasn't an easy, easy player back in the days. But he knew how to get the best out of me. And they, they sort of as a coach, um, that really helps then in the in the years gone by. You really, you know, just sort of learn your players, know your players. But I think further to that what Kai does really well is he's honest with his players. Like he's honest with us. Like if we, he's not just going to give us praise all the time because you know, as a player, if you've done something well, or if you have, if, or if you have if half, half given half effort to a session, like he'll tell you the honest truth. So when he does give you praise, you trust that he's being honest with you and you take that on board. Same, same on the other side. Like if, if you've done something or if you haven't put that run down the line in, you should have, and he'll call you out on it. Like it's, it's, Keep keeping your players honest, and 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 like sort of Kai said, it's he because he, he cares and he knows the people before the player. It, it makes it a much easier process. I think I think the key thing what you said. Thanks, Aka, for I mentioned that. But it, it's more if you split, like the, the split the person and the player. Like you know, yes, of course, it comes together a lot of times, right? But it's never personal. And I, I try to say mm-hmm. that, and it's I coached before, and as. And I'm learning as well. Like, you know, as we're all learning, uh, you know, and, and some, I won't mention when this happened, but there was, you know, a team meeting when I obviously thought, okay, um, give a little bit of feedback and try to improve. And that player came, I mean, good on him, came to me afterwards and said, oh, why are you having a go at me? And I thought, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not having a go at you. I want you to be a better player. I want you to improve. Actually, I like you. I like the players I have. Unless you're really lazy and you're, I can't say the other words, but unless you're really lazy or, you know, you're not thinking team, um, then, you know, otherwise I'll, I'll, you know, I've got a genuine interest in make you better as a player, you know, and as a person, of course. But um, yeah, just, that was, that was interesting that you said that, but try to split that as well. And maybe mention it as well. If you, if you are a coach who likes to give honest and direct feedback straight away, some players might actually think you, you really having a goal so to speak you know yeah and um i think that's a yeah that's a really interesting point around yes splitting the the person and, and the player um and actually taking the time to to describe them yeah it's not personal you know when we are on the field definitely in your in your environment at the top level um it is about performance um and preparing teams to be successful um and yeah just just taking that time to let them know that yeah um i do care for you as a person um when we're out on the field i want the best for you and i want the best for the team um, and I think I can definitely share some experiences on that in saying that when I was coming through as a player, I definitely had some some coaches, um, some great coaches, some some poor coaches, but also, yeah, some coaches who, as you said, kind of knew me, knew that I didn't love defending and knew to just get me out in the right wing and I'll go score some goals. Um, I said I wouldn't mention it, Kai, but... Um, but, um, yeah, but then also the, the coaches that... Um, would almost bait you in a way and, and, you know, try to push you on um, and really, really try, try to test you. And I think, as you said, you kind of learn from, from all the different coaches that you get. Um, but again, I think, yeah, knowing your player 
um, but also knowing the person first and foremost is, is really, really crucial to getting anything out of them. Um, a quick one for, for you, Ben. Um, so from Nick Diamore, he's asked, what's been your favourite tour um, and who's the best player that you've played with? Um, I think the favourite tour, definitely Argentina's up there. That was a roller coaster of emotions, great moments. There's too many, too many moments to, to name. Um, best player? I'm going to go left field, not left field. He, he, he wouldn't <laughs> like that, but Chris Pine, his ability to go from an outfield player to a goalkeeper in such a short time, I've never seen somebody move from such different positions and excel at both. Like, he was towards the end of his career and he would have been about 31, 32 and he made the decision, look, I'm not getting as much game time on the field. I'm going to make help the team out. And that was him putting him himself, his the team before him and saying, well, I think I can help the, the team out from goals. He put so much effort and determination into sort of adjusting to a, to a goalkeeping role. And he was, he was a machine in Spain last year. Oh, he was one of our best players. And he'd only been a keeper for two or three years. It was incredible. Oh, that's, that's phenomenal. And again, I think um, it's interesting how you can draw inspiration from, from yeah, other PL players that you play against, other players that um, you get to play with. It, it's, it's awesome. Um, and I think, again, with that mindset, as you said, Kai, before, of as a coach, as a player, always wanting to continue to learn, um, then you're, you're always open to, to that development side of stuff. Um, so I guess I wanted to to spend just just a little bit with with you guys talking about I guess the the kind of road to to Argentina um, and in particular I guess probably your your best tournament to date and I guess how that experience for for you as a coach guy but then also as as a player Ben I guess um, how it was what you learned from it and then I guess as a team how um, you move forward um, off the back of that competition. So, yeah, Kai, do you want to give us a little bit of a brief around the, uh, the Argentina World Cup? Uh, yes, uh, obviously went through a not so great start. Um, we expected to be a little bit closer to the US uh, in our first game, but we weren't. Um, but we knew against Ukraine we didn't, yeah, didn't have much Ukraine. I said that if you don't know about the Paralympic football, but the top three, four nations are all... Um, professional players and you know living eating together and training together on a daily base so it's always a bit difficult to play against them but then we caught a little bit um, momentum in the first win against Northern Ireland and that sort of um, gone into the next stage and we, we we gotten better and better each tournament and, and the belief grew and grew um, through our wins against Japan and Portugal and that led us for the ninth uh, playoff against Argentina and that game, yeah, no, we, we, we knew, you know, we knew how we could beat them. And uh, we, we were centimeters away on actually doing it. Um, so it, it was it was exciting to know that we can compete. And there's still a lot of work to be done to take us to that level. Um, but it was certainly a tournament that was very, very special, as Eka mentioned earlier as well. Um, the preparation was awesome. Um and that showed within the tournament as well. I said that we got better and better each game. Mm -hmm. And then I guess from a from a leadership perspective, um, when approaching or when even coaching within a within a World Cup, um, I guess yeah, how do you how do you go about that? I guess with games consistently and games, you know, um, potentially the two days or a day after, um, how do you go about that in terms of managing your players, but also managing your staff and ultimately yourself? Uh, trust. Trust is where you have to trust in your players. You have to trust your staff. You have to trust um, trust everyone. I was very, very fortunate. Not only is the playing group amazing, or was was great during the tournament, but I said the staff I had, um, um, the staff we had together was just absolutely incredible. So um, managing yourself uh, once you're in tournament mode, it, it just goes like that. Like it's you, you go into the tournament and the next moment you've got the last game sort of thing. Like because it's the amount of hours we're obviously working in this sort of sort of environment is a lot. Um, but I try to switch off wherever I can as well. Just go for go for a walk and and have some some chats away from football a little bit. You don't have much time for it, but that helps as well as that if you have, have staff as well who can um, to know as well when it's on when it's off 
that switch is so crucial um, because it's important then as well if you go from on to off to then go back on and that's you know that's really really important and players like particularly players learned as well how to do that and coaches and and and, and staff um, that's really important because you need to get your head clear as well at times and um, when you have when you're together for that long yeah and I guess were there any any things in particular that that um, as a team and I guess individually that you guys implemented to help you kind of switch off we we always do and I always try to um, you know if, if it is a team building exercise or in Argentina I mean yes we're at the end in Argentinian barbecues but it, it's more about the recovery because you have a game you have a recovery sorry we have a game you have a recovery we had a few player-led video analyzing sessions mm. as well, which we've changed. It was interesting just to mix it and change it up a little bit rather than them listening to just one, one voice. They actually had to um, work together as a team to then present to the other team how we could beat them. So that was interesting. We sort of introduced that and that I felt, I mean, you know, I can probably tell more, but, but I felt it really worked well as well for everyone to analyze the game a little bit better and, you know, to work as a team a bit better than rather than sit in your room and just you know being on social media it was good for the team to talk football as well a little bit um it all depends really if you have enough time to do these sort of events as well um because some tournaments as i said it's game it's day off game day off game day off and and if we have to do some sometimes we have to fine tune a little bit so that means game and the next day is recovery plus training plus team meetings but that these are long days usually mm. And um, it's difficult to find time in there, but the players are really, really good now, particularly the experienced ones now as well, to to find moments where they can actually switch off. Yeah, um, and I think yeah, the, I guess having the the social element within there, I think works best with with getting people to switch off um, if they're connected and engaged with each other. Um, yeah, chances are um, whether it's a uh, um, yeah, a performance or whatever it might be can definitely um, leave your mind in those situations. Um, I guess for you, Ben, in regards to, to a tournament as a player, I guess what's the mindset going into it? And then I guess from an experience point of view, um, what did you learn and what, what were some of the things that for, for you as a team, you guys kind of kind of um, implemented as, as players aside from um, maybe Kai's leadership? Um. So preparation for us is now a multi-month, if not multi-year, uh, sort of we we build for a world cup every four it's a four year cycle so we start start at, uh, at sort of after after england really we sort of started to focus on argentina and building uh, building what we needed to 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 get to where we how we wanted to achieve and how we wanted to play um sort of uh, sound like a broken record but we we've got such a very tight knit group that we can, we can, we do have the ability to switch off and have a bit of banter between the lads after a game, or probably not straight after a loss against like an America. We sort of got to let that sit and and reflect on what happened. But we we can sort of separate the the game and, and real life, and I think that was important because we're in a position where we lost. We went into that America game thinking that we'd potentially get a draw, if not a a very hard fought win. We got decimated like six nil and to go into a tournament losing six nil it's hard to sort of pick yourself up off the floor to to go again and then the next game is against ukraine it's hard to sort of reset the the mind but it was good that kai thought on his feet and okay our video analysis we're gonna it's gonna be player led and it made it more of a, a collaborative approach and we started seeing the game differently okay we're not just going to wait for Kai to tell us what we need to do on the pitch. Maybe we can notice things on the pitch that we can change as we go. And, and it's sort of, and it's really built from there. Like we're now leading most of the, the uh, video analysis and we find that we're actually talking about strategy, football strategy off the pitch. And it's not just the older guys that are doing it. It's also the younger guy, the 18, 19, 20 year olds who are coming to, to the table with some ideas of, okay, maybe we can sort of build up this say, if the game, if the sort of the space closes down, let's change the point of attack. Like it's just a, it's a whole nother level that we've taken it to now. And that's all because, well, one of the reasons is because we've sort of introduced that player-led video analysis. But like a tournament's such a weird, unique experience. You're in this sort of micro vacuum 
for three weeks where life doesn't seem real outside of it. You every every day or every second day you've got a game that you've got to focus on. It's it's the, the nerves leading up to the game. It's the, the celebration of the game or the commiseration, commiseration of the game, depending on how the results go. And then you've got maybe six hours or maybe a night to sort of reset and then focus on the next game. It's, it's a weird, weird environment, but we wouldn't do it if we didn't love it. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think from, from what you said there around again, that, that player led approach. And it's interesting that the players are the one that play the game. Um, So they're the ones going out and and making decisions and, and performing. Therefore, why don't we ask them? What, what they think and what, what needs to be improved instead of potentially yeah, as a coach coming in and saying, well, I think this needs to be done because of that. Um, so I think, again, that shows, as Kai said, around the trust, um, but also speaks to speaks to your leadership as well, Kai, in regards to, to allowing the players to, to make their own decisions um, and I guess really build that, that team culture there. Um, so I guess from... Um, but I guess post the, the Argentina World Cup and I guess looking into to where Bacani are now, um, Ben, you've started to get involved in, in coaching. Um, I guess do you want to give us a little bit of a, a background as to maybe why and then where you're currently coaching at? Yep. So I suppose the why, it's uh, I feel indebted to football for, for a number of reasons and I feel like um, – uh, I, if I could pass that gift on to just one player, I feel like I've sort of achieved uh, achieved more than more than I could have hoped. Um, so I've been coaching recently over the past few years with a couple of the other Paroos guys at the NSFA, um, the Paroos Development Centre, which have been running out at North Taramara. And we see kids from ages seven to eight all the way up to 18. And it's just really cool to see these young kids who now who have this pathway into the Paroos that they can, there's a, there's a definitive pathway. They can go into the, the Paroos development center, get identified there, then go into a state program. And then from there, go into a Paroos program. Um, but yeah, like I'm so fortunate to be in the position that I'm in where I've accomplished everything that I want in football. I still have a few things that I want to tick off the, the bucket list, but now I'm in a position where I can, I get just as much satisfaction on seeing the younger players come through and, and achieve their goals and see them come into the program as a, a raw talent. And then for some of them to go into kind the kind of players that sort of go toe to toe with some of the best, best players in the world. Like it's, it's such a surreal feeling and I suppose that's what you get as a coach. You get to see these players come through and develop as, as players and, and people. Well, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, I guess um, from seeing you up there, they're coaching at NTRA. Um, I guess the kind of respect that the players have for you, but also the inspiration that they get to draw from the fact that I guess you've been there, you've been in their shoes um, is awesome. And I think, as you said, kind of giving back um, to those and, and inspiring the next generation. Um, I guess for, for you, Kai, just a bit of a question around um, I guess, as you said, that positive reinforcement. Uh, we've got a question from, from Malia. Um, and she's just saying, with, with younger athletes, um, I guess, how do you go about being honest um, when positively reinforcing them with their weaknesses? Um, and I guess, how do you approach that? Sometimes it can be a sensitive topic when you've got to, you know, correct uh, a certain thing within a, within a player, but also, you know, I guess, give them some feedback. Um, and then I guess, how do you also build on that with them in training or away from the field? Hmm. That's that's a very good question, and 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 it's a hard one because you need to get the, the feeling of the player as well. I reckon if you, yeah, you know, if you you can ask a lot of questions and try to get the player to come up with the right answer. Um, so you know, if, if we're just talking about if if the positional is wrong, and then you can know, you can you can ask, oh, you know, what what do you think? Would you consider that, or would you consider going a different way? Um, you can ask if you, if you get the player to come up with the answer without it taking half your training session, obviously, <laughs> then, then that's a good start. And otherwise you can say, Oh, you know, um, you can always ask if, if they're keen to get some feedback because I haven't come across any player um, in my life who said, no, I don't want feedback. Um, so he's no, you, you know, you, you, would you like some feedback on this? You know, and then always ask the question said, Oh, you, do you think, you know, or you can say, well done, but, what would have been a better option? What would have been possibly a better option? So it's always in the, within the communication how you, you uh, particularly with younger players, 
um, because yeah, they can easily uh, easier say because it's hard as well with with young kids who have everything suddenly being told that um, they need to improve on something. Yeah, and it's a generation we're living in as well. Like it's and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just us needing to communicate differently to get the best out of the player, and um, you can do that. And obviously, with a lot of praise. But as Aka said before as well, if you praise an eight-year-old about everything he does, about tying his shoelaces, from getting a water bottle, from you know, it's going mm, yeah. well done for getting this water bottle. That was amazing. At some stage, you know, our kids are pretty switched on, right? They look at mm. you going. That's rubbish. And if you do it with the same voice, the same tone, it's the same thing. So if you're just going to say, well done for getting the water bottle pretty well, to well done about your positioning, and you do that, all of that in, in one voice, it doesn't make sense to a player. And it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't make sense. So I can, you can always, in raising your voice in a positive note, if you really want to re invoice a point, you can um, ask a lot of questions. Um, and even if you don't want to single one out straight away, you can always wait till the ball goes out, walk next to him. You know, you don't have to stop the game all the time. Because I think that's the biggest thing I learned, I had to learn over the years as well, because we're coaches and we, we feel we need to change and do something all the time. We don't. You know, at the end, think about it. If you are a player, one of my biggest pet hate was when I was a player, if the coach, the coach stopped, stopped the session. You know, it got to a point where it's just going, oh. And then you don't even listen to it, right? Yeah. So, no, you want to have fluency in your session. If you have an individual who might be a bit more sensible about feedback, and, again, you, you need to know your players, um, do it after. Yeah, do it after a session. Maybe not in front of everyone. Um, and ask questions. Remember the situation. Paint the picture again. Take five minutes after, after the session, uh, possibly. Or when they have their water break. Saves you saying, well done, get in the water as well. Just get the other ones, get the water and have a quick chat to the, the boy or the girl. Um, I mean, positive reinforcement is still important, but not on one voice and not about things that, you know, um, yeah, don't need to be mentioned sort of thing. Yeah. I think there's some some great tips in there as well, definitely around the communication piece um, as a coach, but definitely um, as, a, as a leader of any sort in regards to communicating, um, I guess, your ideas, but doing it in a way that, yeah, it's not drowned out. Um, potentially using the tone of the voice, as you said, to, to really emphasize a point. And I think sometimes, as you said, in regards to letting the players play as coaches, yeah, definitely sometimes I think we try to impart our knowledge and seem like we, um, you know, have all the answers. But in reality, and I guess Ben would agree with this, that he just wants to play, he just wants to score goals. Um, and if a training session is well evolved around that, he'll be back next week. And I think that's, mm. that's really when it, when it boils down to it and the most important thing that people are coming back to training and, and, and the game. Um, so guys, gonna start to, to wrap up, but I guess I've got a, a few little final questions for you both. Um, the first one being for, for you, Ben, and I guess from for all those players that, that are out there, I guess, what are you, what is some of the, the ingredients or some, some tips that, that you think um, or you'd like to pass on to some, some I guess, up and coming players out there? Um, oh, it, honestly, it's simple. I, I've i never been a, a, the best player, but I remind myself every day that I'll work harder than everybody else. And there's, we're in such a, we're in such a, a point in time where there's so many resources, even if you don't have good coaches, there's, there's good coaches on YouTube. Like there's so many sessions on YouTube that you can find. There's so many resources that you can do for, sessions just by yourself like there's there's really no excuses and and you've got to ask yourself what's what cost you're willing to pay like there's uh, the cost of being in the pararoos is quite high you've got to be training five six times a week like there's it's no it's not a it's a non-negotiable now and it's uh, talent will only get you so far and it all comes down to work ethic and however you get that develop that work ethic if you need to find external inspiration or internal inspiration and it's up to the person you've got to sort of understand the way you work but getting around getting around strong people who are working hard that's going to go quite a fair way um yeah i i'm just a big believer in work ethic and and being around good players don't don't be the the big fish in the small pond be the small fish in the big pond yeah and i think that that's 
that's great advice in regards to yeah, if you work hard, you apply yourself, and you do it consistently. Eventually, it will pay off. And it's a um, patience thing. Like it's not going to yeah. happen overnight. Like you've got to, if you want something, you're going to have to dedicate yourself for years, if maybe, if not months, if not years. Like it's 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 a patience multiplied by work ethic. Yeah. Um, and I totally agree with that. I guess anything from you, Kai, in regards to to a player, aspiring players, any any tips or ingredients that you think make a, a great player? Make a great player. I, I think Eka, Eka just mentioned it there. I mean, there's a technique, there's a tactic, there's a physical, there's all of that. But none of that will actually do anything if, if your, your work rate is not there. So the mental side of the game is, is huge these days. So you're going to have to believe. And the only way you can get yourself belief is by working hard. Um, I mean, we're talking about positive self-talk and stuff. Obviously, you can't tell yourself, oh, yeah, I've done all the work if you haven't done it, right? So belief starts with that. Um, um, and actually, um, I, I love the story when, when Aka said that he didn't get picked as 12 players, not 14. But yeah, when you didn't you get picked, <laughs> no, no, no. But I had to think back when I was under eight, which is, trust me, a long time ago. And in Germany, if you're not a good player, you do not play. So it's not equal game time or any of that. So I spent you know, most of the majority of a whole year sitting on the bench because I wasn't a good player at all. I was skinny. I was just not good. And um, rather than going and soaking and, and thinking about, ooh, 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 you know, I went and, you know, worked really, really hard because I didn't want to spend time on the bench. I wanted to play. And... Uh, yeah, so from that work ethic, then developed this huge passion for the game, and then you realize, hey, I'm actually, I'm actually half okay at that. This, this could, and then it's just sort of spiraled from there. And the more you, the more you've got of that, the, the better you're going to become. And that's, as I said, everything else rolls on from that. Your, your technique, your tactic, your, your, your willingness to learn to get better, rolls on from that. So yeah, I'm, I'm with Echo on that 100. percent mm. Yeah, and I agree. The hard work and the willingness to continue to develop no matter what level you're at. And I think, yeah, Ben really is, a, I guess, a role model on that, as, as what he said at the start of the, the webinar in regards to, you know, he's at the top um, in regards to the power rules, but still, I guess, have of that mindset that, you know, I might lose my position. And that that's fantastic to see. Um, I guess one, one to, or I guess two more to kind of finish off and just saying that, I guess, for you, Kai, if you had to define what what great coaching is, um, if you had to sum it up in a in a sentence or so, what would you say a great coaching? Um, in a, in a sentence. A sentence. <laughs> yeah, give, us, give us a sentence. In my sentence or effective communication. <laughs> effective communication. Okay, I guess I guess the biggest points are I have a roadmap, I have a philosophy, a vision, and where you actually want to go. And it doesn't matter what what team you're coaching. It's a Parus or the under six, you know. And the under six, obviously, you should have a different. Um, philosophy and vision rather than winning obviously but um, have have a way you want to go um, then I think if you can install in your players that they want to come back in training and that they want to be improving and they're really looking forward to the next training and really looking forward to the next game and they just basically can't wait for that sort of feeling I reckon you're, you're, you're halfway there or three quarters there you know, and then all the other bits and pieces come come down to obviously you as a coach wanting to get better um, individually, so you can make your players better in person or as a, as a player. You know, it was that one sentence? Yeah, I think it was. Lot, lots of commas in that one. Longest sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> the paragraph. Um, but I think again, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Having the having the direction, having the the vision, um, and then I guess trying to include as many people within that, um, that I think, again, it comes back down to a lot of the conversation that's happening with Australian football now is that can we keep players in the game? And it comes back down to, yeah, are we providing them that environment whereby they fall in love with it and want to continue to come back? Um, yeah. I guess just just finally to, to wrap up, Ben, um, I guess with, with the Power Roos, um, you guys were supposed to have a, a tournament in June, um, which unfortunately has been has been postponed. But I guess for, for everyone out there, where can they they go to learn more about the Paru story um, and support you guys in, I guess, future tournaments um, down the line? I think from my understanding, I think our website's still www.paru's.com.au. Um, if you want to check out the documentary, like it's been mentioned um, over the past hour or so, uh, you, it's on YouTube. 
um, type in Paris documentary, I believe just in the search that should sort of get it up. Um, we're on all the socials, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, we're pretty active on there. And yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, two easy as you said, powerroos.com.au. Um, and I definitely recommend anyone that hasn't um, been able to, to sit down and watch the, the Power Roos documentary um, to do so. Really, really um, inspiring stuff. And again, kind of touches upon that kind of lead up to the to the World Cup and also, I guess, the, the events of the World Cup in Argentina. Um, so Kai, Ben, thank you so much for, for sitting down. I think to hear again around, um, firstly, your kind of approach to, to coaching Kai has been really, really insightful um, in regards to the player-led approach, but also how much you care. Um, and then to really hear from, from a player um, that he feels part of a family, family and that the team has really, really bonded and come together um, is fantastic. So um, thanks for, for your insights. Um, enjoy the rest of your night. And hopefully, hopefully in a, in a few weeks or months time, we're back out on the field, um, enjoying our football again. Cheers, Nick. Appreciate it. Thank no you worries, very much, guys. Nick. Have a good one. Thanks too, to mate. everyone who was uh, watching as well. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. All right.